So good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. <laughs> and welcome. Um, thank you for your a little bit of patience on the time. As many of you know, our program is just wrapping up a conference at the Faculty Center on Transparency in the Global Food System. And now we're very pleased to be here to begin this event. So my name is Kim Kessler. I am the Policy and Special Programs Director of the Resnick Program here at the Law School. And I want to begin by thanking all of the people who made this event possible. And that starts first and foremost with my wonderful colleagues at the Resnick Program. So we have our, the, our Executive Director. Michael Roberts there in the back and he's actually sitting next to Professor Grace Bloomberg who's on our academic advisory board. Um, Randy Kasumi, our program manager, who's uh, he's been called a lot of things today. I'm going to just say the wind beneath our wigs. She's <laughs> truly extraordinary. Um, and then <laughs> and our, all of our conference uh, um, participants know that and I um, want to give shower more praise on Randy. And I think our teaching fellow Margot Pollins might actually be joining us momentarily. I don't see her in the room. So that's one set of folks, but I also need to thank all of our co-sponsors who have been amazing in helping to bring both this event together and also the broader uh, UCLA Food Day celebrations that have lasted three days. Um, and this is, I think, the culminating event for our Food Day celebration. So first, I want to recognize and introduce uh, Dr. Wendy Slusser, who is the um, director of the Healthy Campus Initiative and leads that initiative with so much vision and has been the orchestrator behind these food day activities that I think many of you have participated um, in behind the la over the last three days. So thank you so much for that, Wendy, and is co-sponsor of this event. Also the Bloom Center for um, for poverty in Latin America, and we have, we're very pleased to have Dr. Michael Rodriguez, who's here and also going to join us on our panel later, which I know will be extraordinary. We have the Student Food Law Association. They are co-sponsors and also helping to organize tonight, so thank you to them. The UCLA Institute of Sustainability, who hosted another Food Day event a couple of days ago, and also UCLA Office of Sustainability. Um, I also want to acknowledge we have Paula Daniels, who is on our advisory board and also the founder of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council, so we're very pleased to have her here. And we are also honored to have the General Counsel of the Agriculture Labor Relations Board here in California, and that is Sylvia Torres-Guillen. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to have her colleague on the panel as well. So those are just the thank yous, but I do want to take a minute to introduce our introducer and, the, and today. So today, <laughs> today is food day, as you all know, happy food day to everyone, and I think that this is a particularly fantastic way to be celebrating that for a couple of reasons. And the first is that you may be aware there has been the launch across the UC campuses of the Global Food Initiative. It's a very exciting endeavor, and the goal of that is to really bring together the work that's happening across the University of California in research and in policy and in community engagement so that we can improve the food system, which we can recognize is really in crisis. And part of the focus of that initiative, I'm pleased to say, is the issue of equity in our food system and how we can work to make the food system more equitable. As part of that, the initiatives included are to have a a system-wide lecture series on food equity. And we want to be able to come together, talk about these issues, elevate this discussion, and understand better what we can do to reform the food system. And our event today is the inaugural uh, event of that lecture series. So you're at the first UC Global Food Initiative um, lecture series on the topic of food equity. So we're glad for that. And then secondly, um, because it is, an, it is an excellent way to mark Food Day because of the particular focus of Food Day this year. So from the Food Day website, October 24th is a day to resolve to make changes in our own diets and to take action to solve food-related problems in our communities at the local, state, and national level. And in 2014, Food Day will have a special focus on food access and justice for food and farm workers. So this is the perfect segue for me to introduce our introducer to the movie, and that's Joanne Lowe. She's here. Um, she is the executive director of the Food Chain Workers Alliance. She graduated from Yale University with a degree in environmental biology, and she's organized with both unions and and a worker center. In 2005, she joined ENLACE, an alliance of worker centers and unions, and a year later she became the co-director. She's on the board of directors of the Domestic Fair Trade Association, the City of Los Angeles' Sweat Free Advisory Committee, and the ENLACE Institute Advisory Board. And I, 
I'm going to say, most importantly, she is also the vice chair of the leadership board of the Los Angeles Food Policy Council, um, where I am her colleague on the leadership board. And we're very thrilled to have her here. She's a tireless advocate for workers in our food system. So, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. So I'm really honored to be here today to introduce Food Chains to you on this special day on National Food Day. Um, Food Chains focuses on farm workers in Florida who started organizing together over 20 years ago and formed the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, one of the founding member groups of the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Um, as many of you probably know, the four largest U.S. food retailers now sell 50% of all groceries in the U.S. I'm sure you can all guess which, which company is the largest food retailer in the U.S.? Walmart, right. Number two is Kroger, which owns Ralph's and Food for Less here in Southern California, as well as other chains around the country. Third largest is Costco, and you may be surprised to learn what the fourth largest food retailer is. Now, anyone have a guess? Target. Oh, I guess you could. This is an educated group. I should have known. Um, <laughs> So, and the restaurant industry, while it doesn't have the same concentrated oligopoly like retail, there are still many large corporations that are dominant in that sector. So with that much concentrated power and wealth, you can imagine how that impacts workers and farmers and everyone down the food chain. Right? So understanding how the power in the food system is wielded, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has developed a successful strategy of going after the corporations that have the most buying power in the food system. And food chains really highlights the Coalition of Immokalee Workers' success in developing a market-based solution to human rights and wage violations. The film also highlights issues that are not only impacting farm workers, but all workers along the food chain, from workers in grocery stores and restaurants to, um, and cafeterias, from workers working in warehouses and driving trucks, to workers in food processing and meatpacking plants. In our survey with, at the Food Chain Workers Alliance, we surveyed over 600 workers all along the food chain around the country, and we found that the median wage for food workers in the U.S. is just $9.65 per hour and almost one quarter are paid below the minimum wage. The food system employs almost 20 million people in the US, so not only is the food system the largest employer, employment sector in the country, but it's also the largest employer of low paid, really underpaid workers in America. With an immense interest in food these days, you know, today's food day, there's over 8,000 events happening around the country, you know, people are, are thinking about where does their food come from, is it organic, is it healthy and nutritious, we need more interest in the hands that feed us, right? And it's really, to me, it's a moral outrage that the people who do the work from farm to plate suffer higher rates of food insecurity and have to use public benefits like SNAP, which is formerly called food stamps, at a higher rate than the general workforce in the U.S. So Food Chains is really helping to bring more attention to these issues facing farm workers and all workers throughout the food chain. And that's one of our goals at the Food Chain Workers Alliance as well. So when people talk about a sustainable food system, we want them to include sustainable jobs for the workers in it. So we're, we're, I'm really excited to be here. The Food Chain uh, Workers Alliance is excited to support this film. Food Chains comes out in theaters on November 21st, so right before the start of our third annual International Food Workers Week, which is the week around Thanksgiving. So we and many of our member groups will be hosting special screenings of the film in theaters, and at the same time we will be releasing our new comic book called Food Chain Avengers. And, so, and we get a special treat here in LA. Um, Lupe, who's a leader, a worker leader of the Coalition of Mockley Workers, will be coming to LA and joining us for a special screening of Food Chains at the Pasadena Lemley Theater on the afternoon of Sunday, November 23rd. So check our website, foodchainworkers.org. Um, we, don't know, we don't know yet exactly what time the screening will be, so check our website and talk to all your friends and family about the film and come meet Lupe on November 23rd. Thank you, and enjoy the film. Thank you. 
So that was a very powerful movie. My name is Michael Rodriguez, and I'm the director of the UCLA Blum Center on, of, on Poverty and Health in Latin America. And it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with this distinguished panel and after seeing this extremely powerful movie, um, I wanted to uh, just give a chance if anyone wanted to share uh, any feelings that they have right now. This is a very, you know, lots of, lots of images, lots of uh, messages in this film. Anyone want to share? Go ahead. Just, just, a, just, a, just a, a comment. Just brief your feeling. I want, I want to make it brief, but just I want to give you a chance to just react. React. Yes, I want to say something first. I want to say my respect to the director and also everyone participated today, because uh, I have very similar feelings. Uh, I'm an environmental law associate professor from Renmin University of China. As you just sorry. And you just mentioned the, uh, the story about iPhone. I can tell you very honestly, I participated in this campaign in China. Uh, in two, uh, 2011, January 29th, it was the first uh, media launch uh, ha uh, uh, happened in Beijing. There was 34 uh, NGOs who was environmental protection NGOs, they want to even to support something to change something. The situation is very similar because the iPhone is a so powerful business company. He give very low up profit for the Chinese local factories, so that uh, the factories should. Uh, uh, like, like the uh, ask the worker to produce more in the same hour. Do you know the uh, maybe you uh, most of you saw the white and the black uh, uh, museum uh, by Jubilee? It's very very quick, very quick. So there was uh, more than two thousand or three, uh, maybe two thousand workers. They they are aged about ten days. 18, 19, 20s or more, about 20s. They work in a very clean uh, factories, have a mask, but it was ordinary mask, uh, to clean the screen and the logo of Apple because it was fingerprinters on that. Usually, in the Chinese labor standards, they should use alcohol. alcohol. But because the private is so lower, so the boss of the company, uh, they illegal change the echo to a very harmful uh, chemical named, uh, I, sorry, I don't know how to say English. It was Zheng Jiwan, you know? Zheng Jiwan. But it was very harmful. It's destroyed the mind of the young people. They, some of them only work there three months. Three months later, they can not even not take the tea birth. How can they feed them by uh, feed themselves by working later? So this was the first story and the first announce. They just want to iPhone to do iPhone can like the Walmart. They say, oh, we're just a buyer. The factory is a supplier. And the, the, the difference is, it was happened beyond overseas. Overseas. Uh, and uh, they just, uh, the NGOs and the workers just wanted the iPhone to recognize this factory was their supplier. And uh, just want them to say, to, to give some power to the, to the factory boss to be comply with the uh, labor standings and the labor laws in China. And also later the second media press, after that, the iPhone, the, the Apple company, they answered that our policy is keep secret. They do not recognize this and say nothing, and do nothing. So the NGOs, they, and the many, many lawyers, one is my students, they participated. 
they get more pro proofs to prove. That was iPhone supplier companies. And uh, luckily, uh, under the help of the N N NRDC, that was a very famous uh, United located uh, NGOs. They, they, find, they find the proofs. Later, the post, uh, the, the new, new I, I don't know the, member, the name of the new CEO of Apple company. When he came to be the new leader, he visited China to sit down with the 34 NGO leaders in China to discuss and to solve this problem. Because Apple, they have the, 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 the policies to be friendly to the earth friendly to the earth. So the problem is very s similar in this situation. And uh, th th thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your passion and also helping us to uh, underscore that this is not just a problem here in the United States, but this is a global problem. Yes. I and I, one, I, more, one more su uh, sentence, just a suggestion. As a law professor or a law student, my, my suggestion is how to solve this situation. Maybe next, next story will happen in some place in Africa or more poor place. How to solve this? How to ask the big companies, big power companies, to control legally, to control, have, uh, have legal basement to control their suppliers, to comply with the labor, the environmental laws and the policy standards. Uh, so the standards is lower than the US or the other developed countries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, this is a human subjects, a human rights issue. Yes. Uh, and and uh, before we started the, the, the panel spoke, and we talked about an order, and, and one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to um, start off with um, Stephen Lee uh, talking a little bit about some of the context and historical issues. Stephen? Thank you, as I was scribbling down my comments. Uh, so first, um, let me just uh, thank uh, Kim and Randy and the other organizers of this great event. Uh, let me also just uh, commend Sanjay one more time for putting together a beautiful, beautiful film. Uh, very, very moving. Uh, I never get moved. I never. Get, I found myself very, very moved. Um, uh, so, as I collect myself, let me just, uh, you know, as Michael suggested, give you a sort of overview. I try and put the struggle of the uh, coalition of Immokalee workers uh, in a bit of context. Uh, and so, uh, one initial question that you might ask is, well. Where does Florida fit into this larger history of agriculture and migrant labor? Uh, you saw a bit of this uh, in the uh, uh, film, uh, where you saw uh, you know, a long history of African-American migrant labor in the South. Uh, but I want to just uh, remind us that uh, these workers currently in Immokalee are part of what I would call the new Latino migration. Uh, you know, Historically, when you think of uh, Latino migration from Central America and Mexico, it, uh, you thought of destination states like California, Arizona, uh, you know, my home state of New Mexico, Texas. Uh, but uh, over the last you know, couple of decades, you slowly have seen uh, Latino migrants go inward to the Midwest and to the South. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, you have seen uh, a rise in anti-immigrant ordinances in places like uh, you know, Fremont, Nebraska, and places in Georgia. Uh, North Carolina, for example, is the largest undocumented, uh, grow is the fastest growing undocumented population in the country. Uh, so uh, I just want to put some of that in context. This is all happening and uh, you know, uh, uh, with the changing uh, directions of, of migrant streams. Um, now, as for uh, the workers themselves, uh, their uh, efforts to draw attention through uh, shaming techniques and uh, boycotts, this all fits in with a much longer history. Uh, you saw uh, the references to United Farm Workers, but this actually goes back much earlier in the country's history, uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, the Knights of Labor and uh, produced or relied on boycott lists you know, for their members to just uh, withhold their services or withhold their uh, money from um, uh, uh, ununionized uh, employers. Um, the AFL also developed the union label at the time. 
uh, as a way of separating uh, workplaces with unionized uh, labor as opposed to those that were not. And of course, a civil rights movement uh, as well uh, during the middle of the 20th century um, uh, relied on this. Uh, now, what's really interesting about the food industry, however, is that uh, you know, many industries in which these sort of boycotts occurred uh, have moved overseas. So it's, it's, in terms of uh, your workers in the United States, it's very difficult to initiate such a tactic. But of course, the food industry is one that remains fairly rooted in the United States. I mean, part of this is because, well, I mean, places like uh, you know, McDonald's and food services, I mean, uh, the whole point of going down, uh, having uh, prepared food is to have it right there available to you. Uh, but even in terms of agriculture, despite the sort of competition that uh, farmers face from uh, overseas uh, uh, farmers, uh, there's an increasing attention in food culture paid to the origins of food. Uh, there's a sort of like local movement that's uh, taking a rise. The farmer's market has become a sort of regular part of people's consumption patterns. So as a result, people are much more fixated on, on, on uh, food in the United States. And as a result, you have this opportunity for workers to develop uh, an alliance with consumers. Um, as it turns out, food law is actually an area of law that's fairly accommodating to uh, trying to produce information for consumers. I mean, so much of today's uh, talks were uh, devoted to that precise issue. Um, now, uh, I want to say that you know, going beyond agriculture, this is actually a move that seems to be uh, uh, embraced by advocates throughout the industry. So just let me give you a couple examples. Um, uh, you know, in the food service industry, you know, the, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock has uh, engaged in various educational campaigns, you know, trying to link uh, consumer interest to working conditions. So, for example, uh, they have uh, you know, guides to um, you know identifying which restaurants comply with certain wage and hour violations. They've tried to make this move that uh, you know labor violations are linked to foodborne illnesses. So, for example, the lack of a paid sick day forces workers to work uh, with sicknesses, and that of course ends up creating unsafe conditions. Uh, uh, you see similarly, um, the Department of Labor has this new uh, app that you can download onto your, onto your phone uh, uh, that is called the Eat, Shop, Sleep app. And it actually uh, you know, lists, if you're looking for a restaurant, it actually will reflect whether or not a particular restaurant has a wage and hour violation you know, against it. So again, that's part of this marrying of this consumer protection framework with uh, labor enforcement. Uh, now, having said that, having sort of laid out this consumer labor alliance uh, tactic, uh, there are a couple of questions or, I guess, um, you know, conversations that I hope that advocates and scholars will begin uh, engaging in over the next few years. Uh, so one might be to explore whether this idea of consumption uh, can operate as a force of inclusion and membership. In other words, is there a relationship between consumption and citizenship? Uh, I, you know, one thing that's really interesting about the Immokalee Workers' Struggle has been that they're actually advancing the interests of workers in an industry that's predominated with undocumented immigrants. Um, this is a, a sharp distinction from past uh, attempts to engage in boycotts. So for example, I mentioned the AFL uh, in the early part of the 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, but it's important to remember that the union labels were designed to try and steer uh, workers and consumers uh, towards unions, but away from uh, uh, employers that hired Chinese laborers. Uh, so in other words, uh, you know, the idea of a boycott and linking conception of citizenship was very much happening on the landscape of race that was exclusionary in nature. Uh, this is much more uh, uh, you know, ambitious and much more uh, representative of the kinds of membership uh, ties that exist in communities today. Um, the second conversation that I'm really interested in having, and this is uh, you know, one that I think really touches upon immigrant rights advocates, uh, workers' rights advocates and um, you know, those, uh, I guess, uh, interested in consumer protection generally, and that is uh, trying to reconcile, or rather trying to rein in uh, the vast uh, uh, reach of immigration enforcement policies. Uh, you know, one of the phrases that was floated in the documentary was wage theft. Uh, now, important, that's an important shift because you know, uh, until, what, 10, 15 years ago, it was just the non-payment of services, but wage theft implies some sort of criminal activity. Uh, and when you have criminal activity in most jurisdictions, that means relying on the police to enforce and investigate and enforce these laws. Uh, but of course, uh, a hallmark of immigration enforcement has been relying on local law enforcement uh, to carry out these duties. And so as a result, uh, you know, 
police, although they're supposed to tend to local uh, matters, oftentimes uh, pull into immigration matters, which makes the enforcement of wage theft uh, on near uh, impossibility in many of these jurisdictions. Um, similarly, Tom Sainz talked about the reluctance of undocumented workers to report labor violations, but I just want to point out something, that the immigration code doesn't make it a violation to work without, uh, without work authorization. It makes it a violation to hire someone without authorization. So in other words, there actually is no immigration violation in working without documentation. Um, what that means is that if an employer reported an authorized worker, they actually would be implicated in themselves, at least as a matter of law. But the fact that that fear still exists, I think, is a testament to the uh, history of non-enforcement of immigration laws against employers. It also speaks to the shortcomings in the law itself, which makes it very difficult to enforce these laws. And I'm seeing that uh, a bright orange sign tells me to stop, so I will conclude right there. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for helping us with the context. Uh, extremely hel helpful to always have a historical context uh, to know where we're coming and also to think about those extremely important questions uh, and the panel agreed to keep their remarks short because we know that there's in a, 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 a lots of power and lots of interest in the audience and so we really want to engage in a dialogue uh, you know today there were two major stars that we saw uh, one is Michael Roberts Another one is Kim Kessler, and, uh, and they were awesome stars that helped to bring all this together. We are also extremely fortunate to have another star in our midst. That's John. John, John, John is uh, one of the stars of the movie. Okay. John is the operating partner of Pacific Tomato Growers. And, uh, and, and certainly outspoken leader, uh, a courageous person breaking new ground. And so, John, can you share a few words, please? Sure, thank you. I don't know that I've ever been uh, introduced as a star before. <laughs> but, uh, um, first, I, I want to say to Sanjay, you know, every time I see your film, I, I'm, I'm brought to tears. And I'm not a big fan of documentaries, and, and it's just not my thing. You know, I watch the History Channel because stuff blows up, and I like watching stuff blow up. And, um, and I love your film. You know, it's just beautiful. Um, so thank you for taking the time and, and spending it with us down there. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm the operating partner for Pacific Tomato Growers, which is a fourth-generation um, farming agricultural firm. We farm throughout this country. Uh, we farm in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, California, and we also farm in Mexico. Um, just to give uh, a little historical perspective, you know, we got into the agriculture business. We're immigrants from, uh, from Greece, uh, from Salonica, Greece, and when my great-grandfather came over here his first job was working in a shoe factory in New York and he promptly got sick and was told by the doctor that he needed to work outside and it was completely related to the working conditions within those shoe factories in the 20s in New York City um, so I have a personal attachment to health and safety and that part of uh, the the worker experience um, I'm also very quick to go ahead and say that you know once upon a time my grandfather my great-grandfather my father my uncle thought that they were doing the right thing and in their day they were and the responsibility of every generation is to continue to learn and push the curve right so for us um, this idea of having a, transform, a transformation in our relationship with the folks that show up every day and work alongside of us from an adversarial relationship to one of real partnership um, is just part of that curve. I, I personally believe, I think that we know more, you know, once upon a time, I can tell you that uh, my family was on the front lines of fighting the United Farm Workers Union. 
back in the 70s. We had strikes in the 70s. Uh, we had strikes in the 80s. I have a scar behind my ear where I was hit in the head with a rock. I mean, that was the nature of the battle that was going on for us, you know, for us and the workers. Um, and it's interesting because for me personally, being, I guess, you know, the, the one that was willing to step outside the box and, uh, um, and I'm not sure how much you all know about this, but the way our agreement, my company's agreement, and then the Florida Tomato Industries Agreement with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers took place um, was basically I sat down with my partners and asked them uh, if anyone had ever met anyone from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And they looked at me and said, no. I had not been working uh, in Florida for a number of years. And so I asked that question, and they said, no, we've let the industry people handle that. I said, well, I don't think that's working out very well. Um, how about if I go meet them? And we sat down, and we had a cup of coffee, and that began a dialogue that lasted into the night. And 30 days later, I had withdrawn our membership from every uh, or agricultural organization in the state of Florida, um, except the one that I couldn't because it's a federal marketing order, and uh, um, signed a direct agreement with the coalition. That started everybody else having to go ahead and look at their own place in the industry and sign themselves. I tell that story because it took someone asking a really simple question. Have you met them? Have you had a cup of coffee with them? Have you ha had a conversation with the human being, not the organization? You know, and, and for me, I think that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about change that's taking place um, throughout this country throughout communities around this country, you know, I, I hate to say it, but it's going to sound kind of crazy, but I think the Great Recession was the best thing that ever happened in this country. There's no big job waiting in Dallas. You're not going to flip your home tomorrow and move somewhere else. People are interested in their local schools. People are interested in their local communities. PTAs don't have to force parents to participate. Uh, the way they did back in 2005, 2006, and it's kind of a fascinating thing to see people all of a sudden become interested in who their neighbors are. And, um, and I think the same thing applies to food, and I think the same thing applies to the workplace environment. At least it does for me. What is really, and there's a, you know, there's a lot of stuff here for me, the, this idea of transforming my relationship and our relationship with our workforce is to stop seeing them as a workforce but to start seeing them as human beings who I work alongside and it's as simple as that you know I mean there are a lot of folks that I get up every day I saddle up and I go to work with the folks that are working on the farm harvesting either doing the harvesting or doing the tying or doing a lot of the physical labor um, there, it's no different. It's no different. And I grew up on those farms, working right alongside of them, you know, when I was a kid. So I get that piece of it. Um, the really fascinating thing around this story to me is the role of non-governmental organizations and the role that they can potentially play, play in spearheading change in this country. Um, and I, I really want to focus on that, well, for the couple minutes I've got left, because that's been my experience, quite frankly. When we start, and there's a lot of talk right now about how do we pass laws, how do we do this, how do we, all the laws are there. There is not a capacity or a will to enforce the laws. That's the bottom line. The laws are all there. People are supposed to be treated fairly. You're not allowed to have sexual misconduct in the workplace. That's already on the books. 
the the issue is the enforcement more importantly how do you go ahead and communicate to a workforce seeing this this immigrant workforce for who they are how do you communicate to them that it is safe to speak out when they come from communities in Guatemala or Honduras or Mexico where quite frankly you don't go to the authorities because they're in partnership with the problem. They're part of the problem. So I think the, the role that non-governmental organizations like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers can play in spearheading this, this change uh, is tremendous. I can tell you right now that in our company, while you'll hear an awful lot about farming companies and agricultural companies being short of labor right now, we're not short of labor. <coughs> People want to work for us. Why? Because we have, they have come to trust that what we say is true. When we say that, the pla that our place of business is a safe and fair place to come to work for, that you're going to be treated fairly, and by the way, if you complain, it's going to be addressed immediately, it actually is true. Three years in, they believe it. So we're enjoying that. But really all that is is just seeing people for who they are, where they come from, recognizing the challenges that they face in their own lives and building their own lives, and meeting that need. And uh, I guess that's really it. That's what my comments are. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. It takes a lot of courage to be the first person to step up. And it is so, so important. It makes a difference. And you've made a difference. And so uh, we appreciate you being here and sharing your views uh, as a grower and as someone who's gone through the process of being an adversary to a trusting friend. Uh, so another person who's very trusted and is a uh, champion of change is Alegria. Uh, and so we're fortunate to have Alegria here who's going to speak on on the law, on on what's going on, uh, on, on the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board and on some of the work that she's been doing. Alegria. Thank you, Michael, and thank you Sanjay and Kim and Michael for making this all possible. Um, I work for an agency called the Agricultural Labor Relations Board and I am lucky to be a regional director um, with that agency. We are tasked with the very important work of making sure that farm workers who come forward to uh, try to negotiate about their working conditions, to complain about sexual harassment for example, um, or other working conditions are not retaliated against um, when they do so. Um, and I do this work from deep places in my heart and in my, in my family roots. I was struck, Sanjay, by that moment in the film where it talked about, one of the workers were talking about how he does this work because of the generations that um, will come and enjoy the benefits of his work. And I am the generation of a farm worker kid from California who enjoyed the work that my grandmother started, that my father and my mother started after, um, after she kind of paved the path for them. Um, and reap the benefit of all of their work. Um, I'm now a lawyer and I, I take this, this work on, continuing their work with a lot of respect and love in my heart for what they did. Um, I started lawyering at California Rural Legal Assistance, which is a legal aid organization for farm workers, um, where I really learned um, kind of the inner workings of California law as well as what was really happening in kind of ground zero of California's industrial agricultural economy. Um, so I litigated on behalf of uh, indigenous farm workers, farm workers who are recent and newest immigrants from Mexico, um, as David Bacon mentioned in the movie, who are the most recent people to get pushed out because of NAFTA and other uh, global policies that have really impacted their ability to live sustainably in their own country. Um, and um, I also litigated on behalf of H-2A guest workers in California, um, whom we are seeing more and more of somehow. Um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but we are. 
And um, I litigated wage and hour issues, pesticide poisoning, sex harassment, housing, and environmental justice issues. So everything that you saw on that, on that film is happening here, right near you, <laughs> not that far away, just a couple of hours. And so for everybody who's in Angelino or from the Bay or from another city, I really want to challenge you to get out of your little frame, to get out of your city, um, to drive three hours, two hours, to go look at Arvin and Lamont and Weed Patch and, and Fresno and Turla and all these wonderful communities that feed you every day. Um, so like I said, I, I, I do this work from my heart and I'm inspired by the, by the people who paved a, a real transformative and positive path to change. And these people that I do this work on behalf of are amazing drivers of our very powerful agricultural economy and, and they feed us every day. So um, I come from an advocate background, and I now find myself in the interesting position of, after having sued the state for many years, now working <laughs> in the state. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the ALRB and how I found myself there. Um, and so in preparing for today, we had a really enjoyable conversation, the folks who are here today. Um, reflecting on the film, and Sanjay reminded me that California farm workers enjoy a relative privilege in comparison with workers in the rest of the country in terms of the kind of strong legal protections that they have um, in the workplace. Um, and at the same time, you know, it's telling about the work that, that I experience as an advocate here in California about how much work we still have in front of us, even with the strong laws and the protections that California farm workers enjoy. Um, and so they, they do enjoy this unique uh, regulatory and legal structure that most of the farm workers in the rest of the country don't. And it's because of the work um, that the first real successful organizing attempt of farm workers by the UFW in the late 50s and early 60s that um, you know, this combination of, of civil rights and kind of traditional labor organizing as well as non-traditional labor organizing that really resulted in a change in the power dynamics that had been historically present in ag labor relations in California, and all of the unrest and instability that it brought. Um, and so it was, it was that kind of action that resulted in the Agricultural Labor Relations Act and, and the board, the agency that, that implements the act. Now the act was largely modeled on the National Labor Relations Act, um, but contains some very significant and critical differences that reflect the unique nature of the ag industry and of ag employment. So for example, the National Act contains a large and lengthy preamble talking about, you know, basically explaining the need for its existence, that um, you know, there's a need to safeguard commerce and to ensure that there's a free flow of commerce and that there's been these problematic folks who have blocked commerce and have made things very unstable and so it might be a good idea to have some you know collective bargaining that would help to ensure that commerce kind of still freely flows and um, so it you know starts with this very different place from where the Agricultural Labor Relations Act starts which I think is really beautiful so I'm gonna read it because it's inspirational so it says it shall hereby be the policy of the state of California to encourage and protect the right of agricultural workers to the full freedom of association, self-organization, designation of representatives of their own choosing, to negotiate the terms of condition and their, of their employment, and to be free from interference, restraint, or coercion of their employers. And so that policy statement you know, that, that we enjoy for California farm workers here in this state is very different from the national level, and it, and it gives to us a, a very different sense of what it is that our job is as a state agency. Other, other tweaks that the, that the State Act made um, solved problems or challenges that were created um, in the National Act, streamlining certain kind of bureaucratic procedures that obstructed timely, quick action to um, get workers back to work immediately that had been um, fired illegally, um, and also changes that recognize that there are no walls or parking lots or, or doors in which farm workers work, that it's very difficult for organizers who are trying to organize them to access them. So it, it created um, situations where unions actually get to go onto the property of the employers and talk to workers, which is very different than what you'll see in kind of traditional labor organizing. Um, so in sum, California farm workers enjoy the protections of a law to protect their organizational rights, it has no equivalent, no counterpart whatsoever anywhere in this country. Um, but from a perspective of an advocate and a historian, I know 
much better than to hold up some beautiful law on paper as you know the marker that there is justice in California for farm workers. And that's because, as we know, laws and the justice that that promise, you know, are are only meaningful when they're enforced. Um, and justice is such a loaded word, and one that changes entirely based on who's saying it and who holds the power at the moment that they're saying that something is just or that justice has been had. So the creation of the act also ensured that the unions, who could have really acted freely in any way that they wanted to because there was no regulatory structure that kind of locked them into rules and regulations about how they needed to behave. Um, and so the act really also rep represents a compromise between kind of employers and unions um, to behave um, in, a certain, in a certain commonly accepted way. Um, but it also meant that um, ag labor relations was then subject to a political process, um, agency appointments, staffing, funding, decisions that go to the very heart of will there ever be justice for California farm workers. And all of those decisions were then subject to a political process. So it wasn't until very recently when Governor Brown was enjoying his second kind of bite at the administrative apple as governor of the state of California that the difference between the vision that he articulated in 1976 when the act was passed and the reality of what, was, what, what the act and the, and the board looked like in 2010 was, was really reexamined. And the state of our agency was dire. Um, we had been cut within an inch of our existence. Agency delays of decades were common. We had cases that were 35 years old, 22 years old, um, where migrant workers and seasonality and weather can transform a landscape in months. So the governor appointed Sylvia Torres Guillen, who was our general counsel, um, who has been fabulous in completely turning around this agency, brought me on board a few months after her appointment. And um, her work has really revitalized and breathed life and spirit back into the promise of, of the act. We've won the first TROs reinstating workers in, in three decades. We've used tools like investigative subpoenas that had gone dormant for decades. I mean, it was just really sad what had happened with our agency. Um, and our recent cases. We have cases about you know, women complaining about sexual harassment because their foreman is masturbating in front of them on a truck. This is in 2012, 2013. We have um, workers complaining about the speed of large and dangerous equipment. This in an industry that has the highest rates of mortality than any other industry in our, in our country. So these complaints and protecting workers that make them are really in California questions are of life and death. Um, I'm, I'm so inspired by the work of the fair food movement and of you know, the, the idea that workers have the ability to take up the mantle of law enforcement themselves, to, um, to feel empowered and to truly be empowered, um, to take the action that, will, that they are best in, in the best position to take. And I, you know, I do believe that the promise of, of agencies like ours can also ensure that when workers speak out like that, that they will not be afraid to lose their jobs, that they will not be afraid to be deported, which is a real risk for people who are still in California with this beautiful law and all these wonderful regulations. Those risks and those threats are still happening every day to workers who, who, who pick their heads up and, and raise their voices on behalf of themselves and their coworkers. Um, I would also say that the great number of undocumented workers in the fields just creates an enormous incentive to break the law. And so one of the easiest things that we can do to transform the fair food movement, transform what are, what are happening in the fields of California, is to get behind a just immigration reform policy and to make sure that the you know, almost 70% of workers that are working undocumented, without documents in, in California, um, are able to enjoy some of the protections and, and just the kind of peace of mind that it brings to, um, to be working with documents, to be working in a much safer situation for them. Um, so I know we have lots more to talk about, and we'll leave some space for that, but adelante, and thank you so much, Sanjay. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. <laughs> you make me proud. Uh, and thank you for mentioning Turlock. <laughs> I, I grew up in Turlock, or at least had, had some of my summers in Turlock, and as I was picking uh, as a young child, as young as 11 years old. So, um, so you know, I, I'm really at awe at these... Uh, these stars in front of me and us who are telling stories. Uh, it's extremely important to have
courageous people out there, not only telling and educating and writing about the scholarly work, standing up for what's right and, be, and being willing to be the first one to do it when no one else will, um, but also those people who are out there fighting the fight right there in the front lines. It makes them amazing stars. But there's someone else who makes these stars, that, who's that strength, who's <laughs> strong to <laughs> make, I'm come on, has the vision. Come on, Sanjay. I'm not going to be the one who gets embarrassed. Um, <laughs> okay, please, wait. Please. Uh, give us a give, give applause. So, my, my remarks are only going to be about 45 seconds long because I, I want to hear what you guys have to say. And I've learned so much, I don't think I can add to any of, of, of their comments. Um, First, I want to thank Michael. I want to thank him. I want to thank the members in this panel and the woman here who is probably the most in-demand person on Food Day in the United States, Joanne. I swear to God, I, I can't imagine how many things she canceled to be here. So thank you, Joanne. And I just want to have my producer, Smriti, um, stand up. Without her, this film wouldn't have been made. And those of you who are on your phones right now as I speak, um, please go to Facebook and like our film. Those of you who aren't, I can't, I can't just express how cheesy it is to say that, but how important it is as well, because all of you saw the movie. Our film opens on um, November 21st in about 20 markets around the country, in English and in Spanish. We had Demian Bashir, Alma Martinez, Jose Ronstadt do the whole movie in Spanish. So we're, we're opening in Bakersfield, Salinas, Pittsburgh in Spanish. You guys have seen the movie. If you don't think it's terrible, please do me a huge favor and spread the word. If the film doesn't do well the first three days, that's it. That's just the way the industry works. The three years that we've spent on it, the work that we hope it will inspire um, won't happen because we're in an industry that's very ruthless. And those of you who live here in Los Angeles know the reality of Hollywood. Um, and those on the panel who said that they don't like documentary films, you know, know what I have to work against. So, <laughs> that's all I've got to say. I'm really eager to hear what everyone here um, has in terms of questions. Thank you so much, Sanjay. So uh, on, on your cue, uh, I open it up for some comments or questions from the audience, uh, thoughts that you have on the movie, uh, things that the, that the panel might have uh, inspired. Yes? I'll just address that really quickly. I think John can speak to that too, if, if nobody records his comments, because um, he sells to everybody. I don't know if people have read Gilbert King's book, The Devil in the Grove, Pulitzer Prize winning book about Thurgood Marshall's battle against um, just the, really the KKK trying to free four young boys convicted of rape who had nothing to do with that crime. Central Florida, where Publix is based, used to be the stronghold of the Klan in Florida. There were more Klan members in Florida than any other state. There were more lynchings in Florida than any other state combined. The area of Central Florida, Lake County, Lakeland, um, Orlando, for decades if not centuries treated farm workers as peons and, and paid them as peons, as sharecroppers, and treated them as, as, as subhuman. Um, that's the only explanation I have for Publix. I'm not saying that Carol Jenkins, who's a CEO, is a member of the Klan. I'm not saying her dad was, but when her dad started Publix in Winter Haven, Florida, I guarantee you that was a whites-only store because the governor at that time in Florida was an avowed Klan member. I'm not saying George Jenkins was a Klan member, but I can guarantee you that he could not do business or start Publix or expand it if he didn't have the support of the Klan. Companies that aren't public, Publix is a private company, have no impetus from ideological institutional shareholders to change. Wendy's, on the other hand, does. 
those of you who are part of UCLA, I'm, I can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure UCLA probably has its pension fund or its endowment is invested in Wendy's. Um, Wendy's has no reason not to sign the Fair Food Program. They have no reason not to bow to public pressure. I think that Wendy's will fall before Publix does. I don't think Publix will fall until it launches uh, an IPO, which I've heard is, is, is um, predicted. John, I don't know if you have any thoughts or that you can share. No, I mean, I think you, you said it perfectly. They're a privately held company, uh, closely held by the family, and so they get to make decisions like that. I also know that there are, quite frankly, lawyers in the corporate world who are sitting around advising their board members that this is a gateway to being a co-employer. And that's the story that we are met with um, by Publix, by Wendy's, by any other. That, that's the resistance and the legal basis. I'm, I'm a high school dropout, so I don't know about all this legal talk. <laughs> but that's what I hear. You know, that's the word uh, that comes back to us, that the idea of being a co-employer um, is something that is being told to them by their legal counsel, and that's what their resistance is. And since John signed the Fair Food Program, Publix hasn't bought a tomato from him. And he's the second largest tomato producer in the United States. Um, so yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Michael. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. Enjoyed the passion of all the messaging that the film presents. I'm wondering, Sanjay, if you could, um, it, it was interesting at the end where Walmart supports, Walmart's in the game with you. So the, uh, uh, there, there's stuff that, that happen. Obviously, you always need leverage. Um, no negotiation can can reach a conclusion, positive conclusion, without leverage. The CIW had the Fair Food Program. They had data. They had a few interested members in Walmart, and I should say for everyone who doesn't know, uh, Michael used to work in Bentonville. Um, not officially for Walmart, but he knows Walmart probably better than anybody in Los Angeles. Um, so you know, they have a, a man there, an executive VP named Jack Sinclair, who came in with some pretty radical thoughts about the supply chain. Jack's not a labor guy, but he, he, he applied an analysis to Walmart's agricultural supply chain, understanding that without labor, their U.S. base of products would disappear. And he felt that he or Walmart had to invest in the same rural economies that they were decimating. It's just Walmart's a big company. There's a lot of contradictions. So Walmart, in the agricultural side, is investing heavily into companies that provide technology so that more and more produce that they sell can be locally grown. Now, for them, locally grown means like growing tomatoes in greenhouses in Maine. Um, but still, it's a, the environmental impact is lessened. So they understood that they understood the value, the dollar value of labor. Of labor. The sticking point for them was the penny per pound. And they agreed to the code of conduct of the CIW. They agreed to the whole fair food program, but the penny per pound. And that took a lot of convincing. And I know a lot of things happened behind the scenes. You know, every food justice activist or advocate that you could mention or that you can think of had a hand in that. But I, I'd, I'd love if, if, you know, there's a person in the room right now who's fighting a battle against Walmart, you know, and, and who represents people or is in the kind of scrum. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Joanne, because I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. They have a long way to go. And they didn't watch the film, or they have watched it. They invited us to do a screening in Bentonville. They wanted to see the film first. And we purposely didn't take out the Bangladesh stuff. They were really eager to see the film. They really wanted us to come and show the film to them. But eight weeks after I sent the film to them, I haven't heard a word. <laughs> so I don't think they like it. Just for clarification, I'm actually, I actually live in Fayetteville. Sorry. Where I was at the University of Arkansas. In fact, uh, Professor Susan Schneider is also at the University of Arkansas in the shadows of uh, Walmart. But I, I think it's, it, it's it, the culture of Walmart in Arkansas is very unique, obviously. But I, it's, I think it's an amazing uh, feat in getting them to position where they are, given the history and the track record, and it's, it, to me that was almost the most startling point of the movie, uh, and I know there's always a story behind the story. Uh, 
I know, I know it's a very difficult thing because it's like a lot of a lot of workers' rights groups around the world have been fighting Walmart in, in Bangladesh, and, and Joanne can correct me on, on the details. Uh, but like the Workers' Rights Consortium, um, they were the ones who 10 years ago helped the CIW devise the architecture of these agreements with major corporations. They worked, or the CIW worked with them recently to present or to, to modify that decade old agreement to something that the CIW was working with now. The Workers' Rights Consortium used that as a template for labor relations in the garment factories in Bangladesh. Um, the British, or the, the European companies like Zara and H&M, um, they agreed, I believe, to, to that framework, but the American companies like Gap and Walmart didn't. And this was happening at the same time that Walmart's agricultural division was looking at the exact same document and had an open mind to it. But of course, the situation for workers directly employed by Walmart is absolutely abysmal. And that's another contradiction that I, I can't get my head around. Joanne, did you want to add a few words? I'm not the only guy out there. The 99 or 98% of the tomatoes grown in Florida are currently grown under the Fair Food Program. So they, every farm is being audited by the Fair Food Standards Council. So I can assure you that even the tomatoes that are, quite frankly, going to Publix from my competitors uh, who are able to sell Publix because um, I didn't talk out loud, <laughs> um, are, being, are grown on farms that are under the supervision of the program, which is a good thing, right? The penny for pound isn't happening, which is a bad thing. Um, I, I will go ahead and say that. I mean, really, it comes down to advocacy and pressure, public pressure on the retailers to participate in the program and sign on to it. Because quite frankly, the power of the program relies entirely on the capacity for the coalition and the Fair Food Standards Council. If I violate the program, if I have problems on my farm that I don't address it through a corrective action or I have you know, a violation that's so egregious that it's not about a corrective action. They immediately contact the participating buyers and my tomatoes are taken off the list. 
So you could be buying my you could be buying a hamburger at McDonald's with my tomatoes or Subway with my tomatoes or Trader Joe's with my tomatoes. And if I have an egregious action on the farm next week, my tomatoes will not be in those retail stores. That's the power of this model. So it really becomes kind of, uh, it's a real partnership. It recognizes the interdependence of the farmer, the distribution system, the retailer, and ultimately the consumer. All of us working hand in hand. The CIW made that happen. They were able to make that connection. Is that? It's, uh, that's an absolutely fair thing to say. And, and to the first part, today the CIW launched a fair food label. They didn't, they didn't want to do it until they had two, three, four, five years worth of data to, to communicate that the program, the label actually means something. That label is being launched in the southeast, in Whole Foods, um, in the southeast region, Atlanta, Florida. It'll hopefully expand. Uh, the Compass Group, a uh, big food service company that services a lot of uh, campuses um, and corporate cafeterias are also starting that program. But as, as Stephen and Alegria, 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 Alegria sorry, okay. uh, I haven't had much sleep, <laughs> can attest. I mean, it's like, it's, it's those labels, right? With the UFW, and with other label, labor groups um, that have really been able to be the consumer facing side of these worker driven programs. But without workers powering them, those labels mean nothing. Um, go ahead. Um, this is a really basic question, um, but what have been the main arguments against raising um, the cost of a bucket of tomatoes by a penny a pound? <laughs> From the, at the farm level, or? Well, there really isn't a legitimate. I mean, I just. <laughs> well, it's economics. I mean, the uh, a retailer. You you don't have mom and pop retail stores anymore. I mean, there are certain parts of the country where there are local retailers uh, that are privately owned. In Southern California, we have Vallarta Supermarkets. You know, Vallarta Supermarkets. They're they're superstars. I mean, they will go ahead and they will sell more tomatoes out of their 43 stores in a week than all every Safeway owned store sells in California. Okay? That's how, because they merchandise. Because they will sell at appropriate retail level. Well, I shouldn't say appropriate retail levels. They will sell for a retail that their consumers will go ahead and per make larger purchases. What happened, I mean, it's, it's really kind of computer driven and I'm going to try and keep it really simple. Once we had computers and once we had data, what retailers figured out was that they make no money on the center of the store. All their money is made on the outside of the store and that's why you see these hot food delis and the salad bars and all that sort of thing going on. So they make all their food, all their money on uh, meat, dairy, deli, uh, prepared foods and produce produce being pretty much number one in terms of where their gross profit dollars come from. So they ride the markets. It's just plain economics. I can tell you right now that for the last four months, I have been selling tomatoes, a 25 pound box of tomatoes for between three and five dollars. For the whole box? For 25 pounds. Okay, so, and I'm not making my money, trust me on that. <laughs> We lost millions this summer. The retailers are taking that 25 pound box of tomatoes, which is approximately a 20 cent farm. That's what they're paying us. And there are costs associated along the way, but not enough to justify selling for 249 a pound at your local Ralph's. Those are the economics of it. So they're supporting this huge infrastructure and it really, now we're getting into the economics. But, I mean, it really happened, a lot of this happened when they made their big expansions and they were able to borrow a lot of money, to buy a lot of real estate, to buy up their competitors for a lot of money, and they have huge debt loads. And it's all, it's that piece, you know? I would just, I would just say the other thing that is kind of really interesting to me is looking at how 
complicated and complex and sophisticated ag economics has gotten. So, and this is just kind of from the liability perspective when you're trying to dig around at like who's the person who's got the deep pockets or who's the person that has, that owns the land or, you know, who's the proper employer in a lot of these situations. A lot of the more sophisticated growers have figured out how to, you know, kind of in vertically and horizontally and all the other ways that you can kind of chop up your business to figure out how, you know, you can take from this to pay here so that you're staying solvent and everybody's got a piece of, of some kind of the business. So, you know, it might be that one, one company is the farm labor contractor who provides the labor and the other company is the distributor and the other company is, you know, the person who sticks the label on the box and the other company is the one who gets it out. The so it's, it's, it, it has gotten you know, incredibly more sophisticated, more complicated for us to understand. This kind of thinks this goes to your question of like, how do we understand and how do we make some of this transparent? Um, it's purposely been <laughs> a non-transparent process to make it that much harder, um, you know, to figure out who's who's stuck holding the bag, who's the guy with his finger on his on, on the nose, you know, and, and that's the goal is to make sure that nobody's got you know, sitting there with the finger on the nose. Um, and I understand, you know, this, this issue of corporate attorneys saying, well, you never want to be caught as a joint employer, because um, that really is, you know, what everybody's trying to avoid all the time. So the transparency issues in ag economics especially are just massive um, and, and make our jobs really interesting, um, really difficult, you know, for, let's see, we've got 10 attorneys statewide for the entire state of California looking at unfair labor practices. Um, nine investigators. So, I mean, that's that, you know, we can win a couple of big cases and hope we send a message that way. Um, because otherwise, to try to kind of tease out and get to the bottom of some of these issues is going to be really close to impossible without the levels of government that we once had. And I think this also goes to the question of, you know, your, your point of NGOs playing a much bigger role in some of what's happening right now. Well, the reason why that's necessary is because there's no more government enforcement because we made decisions to, you know, cut and whittle away. And, and frankly, you know, the, the political will hasn't been there to have people who, who care and who know um, be in the positions that I'm in. And I am sure that given a change in political wind that I won't have a job and Sylvia won't have a job because um, that's not going to be the interest of the people who will be in power at that moment to have people in these positions that, um, that know, that want to know, and that have the ability and the desire to figure it out. Um, I just, uh, and along those lines, you know, we're 48 states down here, right? 48 contiguous states. So the idea of having state laws that the minute you cross the border, everything changes is absolutely crazy when it comes to this interdependent <laughs> system of growing, you know, what is really kind of a security issue as far as I'm concerned, you know, like we should grow our own food or be able to grow our own food. So that kind of, that system of government that we have set up called states I mean, it really, the, and the federal government doesn't have a willingness to get involved in that. It is not capable of going ahead and crossing that bridge. I have been in t an example of that. I mean, here, we're an advocate, and we're very involved in creating safe work environments. We do these audits, these CIW audits that we do on our farms in Florida as part of the required program. We actually do on all of our farms across the country except in California because I have a UFW contract. That was our decision to do that because what we have found is that it makes us better at what we do and if I can't make a living having a safe and fair work environment then I need to find something else to do with my time to feed myself and my family. Now that's our commitment but what ends up happening is that other folks are then go ahead and they stop farming in Florida because the season's over and now they start in Georgia or they go to South Carolina or they go to Tennessee and all bets are off. So we've got workers who are leaving Florida and going to Michigan to pick blueberries and there's nothing there for them. Right? So there's nothing in Michigan that's going to model what it is that their experience was in Florida. The reason I bring, I bring this up is because I've been trying to deal with the federal government on a piece of property that they have empty. Worker housing in Florida. It's been sitting empty for four years. I can't buy it. I have an accepted offer, 
and I can't get anybody to sign the papers. So trying to get government to move on, and respectfully oh, of government, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. <laughs> respectfully <laughs> of government, it's it's like we need, you know, we can't wait to protect people. That's not. It's not like we can wait for right. this system to develop. It's. We know it now. We know people's lives are in jeopardy right now. We know their safety is in jeopardy right now. As we speak, somewhere on a farm, uh, a woman is being sexually harassed or assaulted. Guaranteed. I absolutely guarantee that. That that is happening right now as we speak. Somewhere, it is Friday, somewhere in the United States, there are workers who are cashing their paychecks at a bodega that is owned by a family member of a labor contractor paying five, six, eight, ten percent, and then they are probably turning over anywhere from thirty to fifty percent of that paycheck for money that they owe from the previous week for transportation and things like that. So there's bad, pardon my language, there's bad shit going on. You know? And the time, I mean, here is a model that works. And along the lines of what Sanjay said, getting the message out that there is an urgency and getting conscious people and the conscious people to talk to the unconscious people and wake them up and get them in front of Kroger and get them in front of Publix and get them in front of Wendy's and, you know, let's do something about it. It's kind of like the Home Depot commercial, you know, let's... Build some stuff. <laughs> thank you. I, I, thank you. I'm a little passionate. Yeah. I, we appreciate your passion. And, and I know that there's questions, but we have a reception that's waiting for us. I'd like us to all please say thank you to, for this courageous, wonderful panel who has done an enormous and wonderful job of sort of helping to analyze the, 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 the movie, the issues that we're talking about, and help to sort of bring, bring a, 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 a wonderful end to a, an important, powerful day. And also, uh, I'm going to underscore what Sanjay says, which is, take out your phone, okay? Take out your phone and go to Facebook, and all you've got to do is put in the movie at Food Chains Film. At ch Food Chains Film. At Food Chains Film. On Twitter at Food Chains Film. And whoever has been t tweeting uh, with the conference handle, we're going to tweet the label out right now, so everyone will get to see it. That's so exciting. There you go. At Food Chains, right there. Like it, okay? Let's. That's one step that everybody can do right now, and then go and enjoy a and wonderful Sunday, reception. Sunday, where is the movie opening oh. in Southern California on Lemley, November twenty-first? At the Lemley Theater in Pasadena. It's kind of in the sticks, but you know, take a family member out there, invite friends who are, live out there. Forgive me to whoever lives in Pasadena. It's also going to be available on iTunes, November 21st. It's going to be on cable uh, VOD on Thanksgiving Day. So make it your Thanksgiving film. Send it to your family as Christmas presents through iTunes. Wonderful. It's none of it, unfortunately, but it'll, it'll help a lot of people. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, please, applause for the panel. And and the reception is being sponsored by Healthy Campus Initiative, envisioned and supported by Jane and Terrell Semmel.